just had wanted to respond to one of the questions that you asked the other day and also well, it's a, it, you, it was good fun so round two uh is uh, uh easy to sign up for <laughs> great yeah no thanks um so the question that you asked me was about representation and i can't i honestly can't remember exactly how i answered but uh one way that I would like to answer again is to refer back to the story that I told about the California condor and just to say that humans are so enamored of stories um, in a way that probably uh, no other animals are. I mean, I think uh, from what I've read that birds are, are um, can retain history, but maybe are not as interested, I mean, they're certainly not as interested in, as humans are in stories. So, so I think that's very uh, fair. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's pretty much my answer. Um, and I could refer a little bit to my work. Um, if you, if you throw up, uh, let's say the, the slide that we have of those two pots. Yeah, yeah there perfect. you go. Um, so those are uh, 11th or 12th century pots from Korea, and uh, this is arguable, but probably the cultural production that Koreans are most proud of. Um, and so uh, these were made by uh, potters uh, way back then, you know, almost a thousand years ago. And it's probable that they were indentured servants of the uh, of royalty, right? They were producing these things for the for the court. So you know, they were certainly art because even if the potter was just, you know, trying to save their life by making it beautiful, even that uh, uh, falls within your definition of, of an art world. Yes, but there were probably indeed. all sorts of other forces, right? You know, yeah, and, 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 that, and that's a fascinating thing. I think the, the co-evolutionary framework uh, uh, really identifies what influences can occur that on either the production or evaluation from outside of the sensory, from out, that is cultural, that are structured, that that's uh, societal. And, and so, um, yeah, I think it, it provides a way of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of uh, identifying those, those features. Yeah, exactly. For instance, there could be another kind of art world. Let's fast forward like hundreds of years into the future from that point, you know, just a, a, a little while ago, when you take, you know, let's say these pots have been largely forgotten about, and then you, and then someone starts to look at them and develops a connoisseurship, and that's a whole different. It's yeah, like another, yeah, well, I, it's another I, I did, art world, right? Well, we I was talking a little bit about the ontology of art worlds, but the canon is another kind of a, a mode of existence, right? We right. we 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 cannot, uh, regardless of how we might want to really compose classical music in the original meaning of that word in the, in the you know, in the 19th century, uh, we could kind of pretend, right? But then there's, are these works, or we can't write an Elizabethan play, right? They, those art worlds have essentially been so transformed, but we still have a, a relation to those art uh, objects, those entities, and uh, this kind of parallel canon to our current uh, living, uh, active art worlds uh, of producers and consumers. And it's right. a fascinating so, set of relations. Um, right, so the, so the art world could evolve continuously or there could be a rupture and it could start over again. Or, or a so, speciation event, a, a, a div divergence, right? Because we can think that uh, what Dada painting, you know, went both into different kinds of, 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 of uh, either you know, abstract or the kinds of uh, expressionism and itself uh, ceased to, to be uh, the same, right? Uh, though it didn't, no, it didn't, nobody stopped collecting it or stopped thinking about it, they moved on, but exactly. in a diversifying way, right? Yeah, so let's think about it this way. It's so funny how you try to keep bringing it into art and I keep trying to bring it back into birds. Well, so, <laughs> so, so, so these pots, so these pots apparently I, I, who knows if this is true because it's so long ago, but they say that the potter was aiming for a certain kingfisher blue, like the tail feathers of a kingfisher. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so I described this color to you and, and then, you know, I had gone to the San Diego Zoo to find that species of bird and I, I, did, I didn't find it close at all, right? Yeah, uh, know. you know, first of all, there's a variety of these gray greens of these pots, but they weren't even anywhere near the, yeah, the color yeah. of this very yeah. brilliant so, kind of turquoise. And so you you posited that it's possible that even in that short period of time of eight or nine hundred years, that the color might have changed of the birds, right? Ah, no, I would say that the color might have changed of the pots. No, I don't. I, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, okay, so, so 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 if that's the so case, there must be some other. There, answer. There's no conflict. The only conflict is with the story. The story is either bull, uh, yeah, or think, or or the, or they were or they were uh, or a romantic way to think about this lovely color, which is lovely in its own right, regardless of whether yeah. it's the Oh yeah, and, totally. And and uh, but it, it 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 I think you're quite right. It it doesn't have uh, much to do with even the whole family of possible colors that you see in, um, in, uh, in, in uh, Asian kingfishers. I think there are, there are a few uh, New World tanagers, uh, South American tanagers, uh -huh. uh, that get into this neighborhood um, uh -huh. uh, of, uh, 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 you know, a kind of muted turquoise, but of, a, of a, the, with this kind of, you know, celadon. I don't know what the, what the right, you know, just yeah, yeah, it. that's what that's how they refer to it. Yeah, but the, but there are there are some there are some tanagers that are in this neighborhood, uh, but of course they would not have seen them uh, a thousand years ago in Korea, not even in a museum. <laughs> yeah, I mean Celadon itself is a French name. Apparently, I, I haven't read the 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 piece of writing, but uh, I think it's probably a novel of a character whose robe is of a certain color. Yeah. So I have no idea if, if, <laughs> if, if the author depicted the color at all, but so just, just to say that humans are so, you know, they always have to have a story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if yeah. you, if you can go to the slide of a uh, uh, mimetic uh, painting that I made in response to these colors, if you have it, do you have it? Yeah. So those two outside, that's about a, that's like a nine foot by 18 foot painting. And this is um, your painting? My painting in oh. three, pe three pieces. Um, the middle panel is of a different era of Korean pottery, but the two outside flanking panels are of uh, that celadon color, which, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I entitled this work Flight of the Kingfisher, which, you know, may turn out to be a, to a a kind of misnomer, but um, an interesting story. Well, anyway. culture on culture on culture. Exactly. Yeah, so I want to ask this question that I that is kind of a complicated question. So maybe it's best that I forgot about it during the the <laughs> our talk the other day, um, because it might have just gotten bogged us down a little bit. And and since we're just talking between ourselves now, it's okay to be bogged down. Yeah. Um, so. Um, let's go back to, um, I, I, I only know this having read uh, your book, the evolution, the evolution of Beauty, which just totally, it really, uh, it was a huge thing for me to read because it really influenced my, um, my teaching, actually. Um, but, so it's from that writing that I learned that, um, Darwin's, the, 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 the book of Darwin's Origin of the Species that we all kn know is only part of the story. And that you, you in that book basically emphasize this other book that he wrote subsequently, right? Mm -hmm. That and, he sent to man. Yeah, which, which emphasizes uh, this other theory of, of mate choice, which, which, um, I don't know if it's equally or at least though these two natural selection and this mate choice sexual uh, selection, the, yeah. sexual selection they they um together are the two great influencers of evolution right um but the way and, and we explained that during the talk you explained that partly or maybe largely through sexism that the sexual selection part got 
erased or suppressed, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think in the book you call that point of view that became unfortunately dominant, the only natural selection point of view, you called it the adaptationist point of view, right? Yeah. And, the, so, and, and, the, and the, to emphasize that, that it wasn't merely uh, sexism, the sexism had a purpose and the purpose was to prevent uh, the aesthetic view from having an intellectual role in the science, right? It was really, uh, if you will, the intellectual hedgehog perspective, right? One, one big idea as explaining all things. And, that, and, that, and that, that one big idea, the powerful idea was adaptation by natural selection. Yeah, which feels like which, a very male impulse to and, make and, Yeah, one. certainly, but it's also, it's also, it's also a reductive and uh, uh, singular view. One of the things I think happened is people went from monotheism to monoideism, like one idea. And, right. uh, and, and, and they really, uh, at, the, uh, at the, uh, what, the first review of Descent of Man proposing sexual selection, um, uh, Darwin was accused of being a traitor to his own brilliant theory. Wow. Right? And, and, and of course, because the great advantage of, 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 uh, of sexual selection, or sorry, the great advantage of natural selection was that it had the power to explain everything, right? And, and so they wanted to preserve right. that intellectual power by uh, arguing for basically a simpler universe than Darwin was capable of, of dealing with and conceiving. Right, so here's my question. It's kind of a simple question. I hope I can articulate it. Um, if, if, given your views, if the adaptationists were actually correct, then how would our world look? In other words, I, 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 I'm, yeah. I kind of I infer, I infer that um, the, the, the genders of, of birds, which, which are usually very different looking, would be more similar. You know, you give the example in your book that the, the, the Darwin's famous finches' beaks are very utilitarian and there's mostly natural selection at play there. So some of them have bigger beaks to, to bite, you know, right. to crack bigger right. seeds right. and right. some have more subtle beaks to, to get into other kinds of food. Um, but if there, were, if there were no sexual selection and only natural selection, then you wouldn't have like a lot of this kind of ornamentation. Right, and I, 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 th I, think, I think you're exactly right. And, and one way to, uh, one analogy would be to imagine a natural world in which there was no art. Imagine a human world with no art. What would it be, right? Yeah. Uh, everything would be utility. There would right. be no, no uh, sort of, uh, you know, sensory salience. Nothing would stand out except for its utility, like a stop sign uh, or, or, a, or a fire hydrant. And, uh, and, and um, so in the natural world, the things would be drab they would not smell uh, anything other than offensive or maybe not even that, right? They would be, uh, or they would smell, you know, they could potentially smell offensive, you know, to defend themselves. They would yeah, be yeah, armed yeah. Uh, and they would not sing songs. The only things that would be acoustically would be alarm calls or, or back off Jack aggressive notes, right? Um, right. So, so a certain kind of diversity would be suppressed or, or would just yeah. be useless. So there wouldn't There'd be, be no flowers. You wouldn't have, there would you wouldn't be no have, fruit. You wouldn't have arbitrary traits. Uh, they, they would just be gotten rid of immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, 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 so I mean, and, and, and obviously when you ask how important is this idea to explain the world, um, the it's answer huge. is huge. Or it actually reminds me uh, of a conversation I had with a physicist, right? And, and I said, you know, uh, he's a, you know, a particle guy. And uh, they were, I was asking, him, well, so what about dark matter? I mean, it's like, uh, you know, a huge unsolved question. And it's like, hey, why do you have confidence that you're approaching, you know, uh, final answers? And he's like, he said, okay, so we might have description only of 5% of the universe, but it's the 5% we care about. 
<laughs> so, so, right, so right, in this right, right. case, in this case, you know, it, it, uh, you know, it, the, the fact is that the same the, kind of thinking, the, the aesthetic part, the aesthetic part is a part that we care about. Right. right. You know, the song of birds, the color of flowers, the smell of a peach, right? These things are all uh, uh, evolving because of, uh, you know, aesthetic evolution. And, and without that phenomenon, uh, the world would be uh, uh, a different place. And uh, I mean, I, I think it's a, it would be an opportunity for, um, uh, you know, kind of science sci-fi. <laughs> but, totally. but you know, we can see we can see it already. I mean, we can see you know, birds. Uh, most mammals don't have color vision, right? Uh, and so you look at the color of most mammals, and it's very very drab compared to. Right. And and of course, there's a richness in the textures. You know, if you look at the hair on a deer or anything, I mean, it's a marvelous material. But it's right. not nothing like uh, the kind of uh, patterns that grab you. Uh, uh, in birds, you know, except yeah, except and 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 uh, with the exception of bats and and whales and elk, they're not singing songs, right? They're, so so we could see it in various places, moths, right? Uh, very very boring, except olfactorily, they are beautiful to themselves <laughs> and actually sing songs too. So 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 uh, there's Wait, places in the world sing songs. Yeah, they sing uh, ultrasound. They make little buzzing sounds to e each other. Huh. Uh, and they also jam jam they make sounds to jam the radar of the of the bats too but that's wow. a, that's not a that's a pure utility right that's purely adaptationist yeah 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 um so let's um there was there was a point during the conversation where you uh mentioned these bower birds i just wanted to give you sure. a chance to show some examples of them just because they're so sp speaking of like arbitrary um ornamentation and uh especially because especially because these are not um whoops i don't know where my bower birds are exactly oh whoops sorry. do you want to let, let me go find you, okay cool uh Take your time, no problem. Oh, maybe they're in another PowerPoint. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, so can you explain what's going on there? And so, why so, are the so the bowerbirds are one of these aesthetically extreme uh, species of birds. And, and um, I think we were talking about, uh, uh, you know, the aesthetic lives of animals. And I was giving them an, as, a, as an example of maybe the most aesthetically elaborate uh, group of organisms on the planet, right? I mean, uh, and so what they're like a lot of these uh, extremely beautiful birds, the female does all the nesting uh, and the male does nothing but display. And uh, um, the, the female can get away with this because they feed fruit to their offspring and fruit want to be eaten, right? So living on fruits like milk and honey, right? Those are things that, that are designed to be eaten. And so, uh, you know, that means that they can raise the kids on their own and, the, uh, and then, but they have in exchange for doing all the work, the females have the opportunity to choose whatever male they prefer. And, um, and so as a result of that, they have had the evolution of elaborate courtship display. And part of the displays of the bowerbird uh, includes the bower itself. And this is a picture of a satin bowerbird with his bower. Now the bower is this stick construction in the back. This is called an avenue bower because it has a passageway with two walls on either side. And then so the why front, are there walls? Well, uh, well that's just, uh, this is architecture. Uh, uh, that one answer is to say why not, but also that 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 uh, that it's uh, it's it's what has evolved in this in this particular in this in particular bird. So they also um, uh, ornament the the, it, the 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 ground in front of the bower with um, with ornament. And you see in the and 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 these things depend on the species, different species, and even in some species, different populations collect different sorts of ornaments. And in, in the case of the satin bowerbird, it's all about blue. 
And you can see that this has a natural blue object, that blue feather, which comes from a parrot. Oh, by the way, bowerbirds live in Australia and New Guinea. So this is from Eastern Australia. And um, you can see he has a blue feather from a parrot, uh, but he is also has blue uh, you know, soda bottles and blue straws. So the, the, uh, the Australians can't help themselves but give blue stuff to the bowerbirds. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the trashy objects remain forever and get stolen between the bowerbirds because they're so beautifully blue. But they like hilarious. this one little shade of, of blue. Yeah, and so it's it's not a coincidence that there is that there seems to be that shade of blue on the bowerbird's body as well. Well, this the 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 sheen on the bird's uh, body, the kind of glossy in its deep satin color is actually vividly ultraviolet. So it, the bird wow. the bird is as brilliant as the feather in the UV, wow. but that is not sensitive to us. So we can't see that We can't see it. I mean, we get a little hint of it. We, is that yes, what you're saying? Yes, exactly. We, we, get, we get the gloss off the surface of the feather, but we're not actually get which is whitish it, to our vision, but it's actually brilliantly ultraviolet uh, to the bird. Got it. And then it has that wow. violet iris. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Crazy. Exquisite. And we don't actually Amazing. know the... Uh, chemistry or the physics of that color quite yet. But uh, so, what, so I, what, I was, what I was trying to get you to talk about was, you know, so the female, this is the male doing the so kind of curating here. And the sure. female, the female doesn't participate in that part of it at all, right? No, well, He's, this is in this, in this art world, if you will, uh, the males are creating these ornamental features because the females prefer them. And the females visit the, the different bowers um, and, uh, and then choose among the available males. And so, so how, in, the, how in, the and where? in the next species here, we see how the avenue works. Now that's actually a male, but that's where the female sits when the, when, the, when the male is displaying. And the male will come out front while the female's inside the avenue and do his displays with uh, his ornaments. So the bower is not a nest. It's a, a if you will, a seduction theater uh, with one seat. And that one seat is for the visiting females. The, fe the males uh, build their bowers. It takes them four or five years uh, to get old enough to make one. And they build them and they curate them for more than a decade. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and they evolve both uh, 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 biologically. So males make them because females prefer them. Females select on the bowers they prefer, and then there's a radiation in the in the an aesthetic radiation in the architecture of the bowers. So, is there an adaptationist uh, uh, reason for the well, there's architecture a, there's of a, that there's tunnel a, bower? Uh, there's a there's a there are a set of hypotheses. So, for example, this guy likes blue, and the idea the adaptationist idea might be that blue is is rare in the environment. So by showing blue, you can show how good you are uh, compared to other males, that you're cognitive, you have a better brain because you can find more blue stuff, right? Um, but people have studied different species and found that the, the, uh, the objects that people prefer or that the species prefer are not necessarily rare in their environment or two species that live in the same environment are collecting different things. And so therefore, you know, if it was, the, if it was just showing the rare thing, they'd be competing for the same object, right? So well, um, also, also I can tell you right now those blue bottle caps are a really nice blue, but they're not very rare. <laughs> not anymore. Sure. Not anymore. That's true. But this is a kind of interesting thing. This guy, uh, this species, the great bowerbird, lives in dry Western Australia, and and they uh, collect white things, uh, bone or 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 bleached sticks, uh, and, and and clearly in this very dry habitat, that's not particularly rare. But this species, this individual uh, lives uh, about a, a, a kilometer or two from the Indian Ocean. And on the Indian Ocean is a cliff. And in that cliff is a, uh, is a stratum. Uh, and in that stratum are fossils, fossil clamshells. So this bower is ornamented with a pile of fossil clamshells, uh, which is extraordinary because uh, this guy, when he sings his song uh, to attract a female from the top of the tree as they do in the mornings, uh, they'll sing. He's actually singing, and he's saying, "Do you want to come over and see my fossil collection?" <laughs> right? Which is so, literally what he what he what he is uh, collecting here. So the so, the, the, the ornaments are deeply uh, elaborated, 
there is this element of evolution, the preference for white, but then it's deployed in a particular environment uh, to, uh, to this other kind of component, which is, which is deeply environmental. What kind of white things are available in your, in your world? Well, I mean, the criteria must be more than just color, especially in this case, because if they're going to that one stratum, for the most part, they're going to find a very similar coloration there. Sure, so they're all bleached white. Be they're all shade. bleached white. They're all right, bleached so white. And so, so it's, a, you know, in the middle of Australia, they're, they're going to be going with a little bone because that is the whitest sort of physical sculptural uh, uh, Okay, I so see. So they, I think what they have is a fixation on white and then, and then on, on um, uh, sort of form. It's a so white you don't form. Think... Uh -huh. And, 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 and uh -huh. so in other places without shells, uh, they go for something totally other. Yet species, there are species in New Guinea that do nothing but snail shells. It's just a pile of snail shells, right? Uh, brown, they happen to be brown helicals, you know, shells, right? So they, they, they can collect uh, all different kinds of things. And the architecture so can also differ. This is a, a, what we call a maypole bower. It has a kind of Charlie Brown Christmas tree looking structure in the middle. And then this runway around the outside. And the male um, sits in that runway and decorates the bower uh, with all sorts of different, uh, different uh, objects. In this case, you can see this guy, he has bluish pebbles. And then these vividly blue fruit, these tiny little berries that, that he's using. Uh, to, and to a, and again, I, 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 I can't believe it's an accident that that, that kind of blue and then the, the orangish yellow of its feathers coloration are, are totally accidental. That well, but interestingly, be... some of the things that he, you, you can look around here and you'll see little uh, black uh, fungi. Those are oh, just right. like little weird fungus. And this guy is using orange, orange uh, flowerets. And then in some of them on the little ends of the twigs, they hang caterpillar frass, which is like um, kind of, uh, it's caterpillar poop, <laughs> but mixed with, a, with, mixed with kind of, uh, what would you call it? It's kind of uh, silk. It's got little silken threads, which are mixed with the poop. And so, you know, yeah, the blue. Wait, the bird mixes those two things no, together? No, 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 the already... caterpillar's oh. making it that way. And then oh, they take oh, them. Oh. So it's kind of like literally like Christmas tree ornaments, except the ornaments are caterpillar poop. So, you know, uh, the, it, 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 the stuff they ca that they carry, some of it is at least obviously aesthetically salient to us, but some of it is also just weird as heck, right? So, so w when I was asking you about the adaptationist interpretation huh. of the of the architecture i was I, I wasn't actually exactly throwing it back to the previous question i was trying to get you to talk about like literally the architecture d doesn't the architecture um serve an architectural purpose for the sure theme, sure and that and that's visiting a, that's female a, that is that's a that's a that's another uh fascinating topic and it and it's about the interaction you know, we talked about, uh, you know, the effect of, of indentured, you know, slavery yeah. on, on the potter a thousand years ago, right? That's a cultural influence on the aesthetic process. We, we, that is not unique to, 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 um, to humans. But one of the cultural, um, or, or at least uh, behavioral, in the moment, social, interactions with the set of process in Bowerbirds has to do with uh, uh, essentially sexual harassment. So it's an interaction between aesthetic evolution and what we call sexual conflict uh, or sexual violence. And um, um, what happens in Bowerbirds, or one of the things that explains the architecture is uh, the fact that the, um, the architecture allows the female to approach the male at great uh, intimacy you know, really, really close, uh, literally an inch or so, and see all of his stuff and see him without sacrificing the independence to still make a choice. Because in, 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 in some species of bowerbirds that have very simple bowers, as soon as the male lands or the female lands on the court, she's immediately copulated by the male. And he can force his, uh, uh, or at least uh, attempt to force copulation uh, on her. 
So one of the features of the Avenue and Maple Bowers is that it prevent that. So it's protective. And we can imagine this, if the, the female is in the bower like that, and if we just go back and say, here's the position of the male displaying in the front, right? Um, so if the, if the male decides he wants to copulate, then uh, he has to go back around the bower, uh, behind the wall, to approach this individual from behind, which gives the female a chance to pop out of the bower and- uh, Get the hell out of there. Get the hell out of there. This is kind of a protection uh, from sexual harassment. And so hmm. what, what that indicates is that the female has used, has used, or preferences have evolved for those aesthetic features that actually further her freedom of choice, her sexual autonomy, right? Which is a social factor that is not directly aesthetic, right? But uh, obviously the bower is both beautiful and aesthetic and architecture, but with this kind of correlated functional element, right? And we could see the same thing occurs in the, in the, uh, in the maypole. Uh, for example, if the, the birds are on either side of the maypole, if the male is over here, the female will be on the opposite side. And as the male comes around, the female just shifts. They just shift around the maypole with the, with the pole in the middle, right? Uh, and one of the reasons why this guy has a long crest is that he sneaks it and he opens up the crest so that she could see it around one side of the, of the pole and then on the other side, right? So he does this active dance, right? Um, uh, that are, are about, uh, and they elaborate in the context. So one of the things we ask, of course, is what do females do with their freedom? And the answer is that they choose arbitrary beauty, right? that they, given the freedom of choice, they select on those. And what you have is this, as a result, this explosive aesthetic radiation in the architecture of the Bowers, which is, um, uh, you know, they choose the installation. diversity. So they, they, I, they choose the installation that they like the most. And, and that tends to radiate outward aesthetically, like to be the weirdest right, and right, right, strangest. Right. And, and, and so what, we, what we're faced, we're in the situation where we can actually say freedom of choice begets aesthetic diversity, beauty in nature, right? And that, and that, and that, is, a, that is a scientific uh, statement. And, and that's, could you a, go, that's an amazing could you go, aspect of, 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 uh, of kind of this, uh, uh, aesthetic understanding in, 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 in evolution. Sure. Could you go as far as to say uh, nature seems to value maximum diversity? Not really. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I, I mean, uh, I don't think nature or, or just has diversity. values. It has, it, it, I mean, if, if we're either going to get rid of the word or we could assign properties to it, right, uh, that are kind of our scientific generalizations. But I don't think it has, um, uh, you know, preferences, agency. <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> right. Yeah. And so, so in that sense. Um, but, uh, but I think what we see here is that at various times in the past, including in our own evolutionary as human history, um, situations have evolved that promote uh, aesthetic diversity, right? And that's, uh, and and. And that's another uh, um, advantage of thinking about the world, a uh, natural world, or biological world, a a aesthetically. We can sort of so, understand that. So I don't want to keep you too long, um, but I wanted to end on this this note. Um, the 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 bowerbird that you have up, the maypole one. Um, you, you talked about it dancing around the maypole, and and I know this isn't a bowerbird, but you, I, I think you have video footage of uh, the superb bird of paradise, and yeah, this guy can't. here. There you go. Yeah. So let's end with <laughs> well, let's end, yeah, with so this. We can end with this guy because why not? You know, uh, this is the uh, uh, superb bird of paradise. This is footage taken by Ed Scholes, my my former student uh, now at uh, Cornell University, and. Uh, this is, again, another aesthetically extreme bird of paradise. The female does all the nesting. And this male is displaying at his traditional site that he's probably is at every day for 10 years. And there's the female. He approaches him at this great party. 
Now, you know, talk about representation. You know, is that a smiley face evolved <laughs> in, in another species? You know, that smiley face is not a, a product of, of, of 60s popular culture, but, uh, but independently evolved in, in, in New Guinea, in, 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 uh, in Birds of Paradise. I'm not sure. But it, it, it certainly is extraordinary. And we'll see it again, just to point out, you know, that blue color is a photonic optical structure made with melanin granules in, in, in the bird feathers. And then, and then, Wait, so, so it's not actually, it's not, so it's not so called structural color then. It is, yeah, it's a structural color. Yeah, it's a structure. That's uh -huh. a, a more technological or forward looking way of describing it. It's a structural color. It is made by optical interaction. But the black around that blue is some of the blackest material ever found in nature. And it turns out that this is what we call super black. And uh, it has microscale cavities where the light goes in and bounces back and forth and, and can never exit. So this is almost as dark as Vanta black, which is the blackest human technology. Um, and so one of the questions is why be super black? Well, let's see, show it one more time. So what, <laughs> the, and the reason is that uh, we are constantly estimating, we, to, to, to have color vision in a variable environment, you have to control your, or white balance your color perceptions for the ambient light, right? So right now, viewers could see me and you say, well, there's kind of a yellowish light in the room and there's kind of a whitish light coming in from the window, right? To, 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 to tell what color is that shirt. But here, the bird is a, around the brilliant color, it's eliminating all the specular reflectance, all the little white highlights that give you information about the color of the light. So what basically happens, it's it, what happens is that you're 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 jamming, you're messing up the color yeah, yeah. facility, which makes so the color pop out like psychedelically or look like it's creating its own light, glowing. Right. Right. Also it has the uh, the 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 practical effect of saying you can show up you can show up at, at my log any time of any time you want, except for the middle of the night. And you're going to get the same great show. You're going to get this <laughs> yes, amazing it's, blue. It's controlled for the environment, but I, but I think what it really does is just uh, uh, blow the color perception. There is nothing in the world of that bird anywhere near as brilliant as that perception. That moment is orders of magnitude away from any other part of the bird's life, mm -hmm. right? And so why not, right? right. So what we've shown is that super black has evolved in at least 15, 16 different families of birds all over the place. So, so why be super black? The answer is velvet Elvis, right? You know, or, or Goya. There are, there are higher examples than Elvis, but of where, where putting a brilliant color on a matte black surround makes that color pop by, because it disturbs with your uh, local ability to, to, um, to control for the ambient light, right? And, and I think that Joseph Albers, uh, Mondrian, and again, Goya, there's a whole history of adjacency, your work, looking at adjacency and its effect on our perceptions. And what's fascinating is to find out that not only do birds have these things, that they excel to the point that they've, they've evolved some of the, essentially the blackest materials in nature in order to create that perception. And I, I think there's no other way to interpret that as, except as, a, as a, an achievement in aesthetic uh, biology, right? Uh, of the highest order, right? And it took us uh, centuries until the 20th and 21st century to create material that's as black as that feathers anywhere in the world. Wow, oh, amazing. Um, thanks, Rick. Well, thank really you. It's been fun to dive back in. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe we should do uh, part three. Rick yeah, asks let's violent do part... questions about his art. <laughs> let's let's uh, let's do part three with pizza and beer in a real real <laughs> it, it, at bar with a real audience, yeah. Peabody audience. Well, totally. I look forward to that. Yeah, me too. Have a great weekend. And you stay safe. Be well. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.